Today, we are going to continue in our look at complete forgiveness, what that means like in biblical terms, to completely forgive someone. And this morning, we are going to look at enduring mercy. We're going to look at the role that mercy plays in forgiveness for not only us, but uh, as, as Christ is forgiving us, but for also as we kind of begin to look a little bit more intentionally at forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. Now, mercy is one of those things that I don't know if it gets quite enough attention. Uh, God's grace gets a lot of attention in our lives, as well it should. Uh, it's the amazing grace. Uh, it's grace that He gives us that we don't deserve. And many of you have probably heard mercy and grace differentiated this way, that God's grace is when we receive what we don't deserve. And so it's Him giving us what we do not deserve. It's God's grace. But God's mercy is what keeps us from actually getting what we do deserve. And without mercy, without God's mercy functioning and flowing in our lives, then we're not going to be able to experience His grace. Without His grace, we're not going to be able to experience His forgiveness. And I believe that if there's one area, to boil it down, if there was one area that I would truly challenge all churches on would, it would be this of become more merciful be more merciful now the hebrew word for mercy which we're going to be looking at today in the old testament is hased now you'll see on your screen it's got a couple different things god's mercy his grace his compassion and his loyal love and this is uh, showing God's love and His mercy and His grace, His compassion towards us. And then it's also used in the Old Testament to show and to challenge us as to what the way that we interact with each other. The way that you and I view each other, the way that we react to one another, the way that we see each other needs to be through the lens of mercy. And if we're being honest, mercy, God's mercy, is what has us where we are today. We are here because of God's mercy. Amen? We're here because of God's mercy. And mercy has to be at the center of who we are. God's mercy in our lives needs to flow through our lives, and His mercy needs to be the very center, the very heart of everything we do, everything we say, every interaction we have, every attitude that we have has to be focused on God's mercy. I remember about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, I made this statement to you, and I kind of want to uh, throw it back out there again. I think you should open each and every prayer that you pray to God asking for His mercy. Because it's by His mercy that we are where we are today, and it's only going to be by God's continuing mercy in my life that I continue to breathe. His mercy is what is responsible for us being where we are today. Without His mercy, we would not experience His forgiveness. Without His mercy, we would not experience His grace. Back in, the, uh, back in the late 19th, early 20th century, there was a quote that came out that uh, there's been a few different people it being attributed to, but I just want to throw it out there to you because I believe that it helps us to kind of frame mercy, God's mercy, a little bit better. And the quote is this, is that God's mercy is not that He saves everyone but yet god's mercy is that he would save anyone it's not god's mercy that he saves all it's god's mercy that he saves any so i want you to turn to the book of psalm i'm going to be reading out of chapter 136 this morning now i'm, I'm going to need your all's help this morning we're going to be reading all 26 verses and I'm going to read the first part of each verse, and then I want you 
to finish each verse for me. Now, we're going to put up on, here on the screen, this is your part. All right, this is your cue. Now, again, there's 26 of them, so I'm really going to need you to stay engaged with me here. Okay, because this is not one of those kind of like first verse of a worship song where everybody starts off real good, and by the time we get done, it's like, okay, so stay engaged with me here. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to give verse 1 a trial, trial run here. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. That sounded good. Keep that up. Verse 2, O oh, give thanks to the God of gods. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. To Him alone who does great wonders. To Him who by wisdom made the heavens. To Him who laid out the earth above the waters. To Him who made great lights. The sun to rule by day. The moon and stars to rule by night. To Him who struck Egypt in their firstborn. And brought out Israel from among them. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and slew famous kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel his servant, who remembered us in our lowly state. And rescued us from our enemies. Who gives food to all flesh. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Well done. Did you notice a theme there? By any chance. For his mercy endures forever. Some of your translations that you're holding may say that his love endures forever. For his compassion endures forever. For his kindness endures forever. Understand that we just read a passage right out of the heart of the Old Testament times of where God is perceived as a God of judgment and of wrath. And the theme statement for 26 verses with every thought, sometimes in the middle of the thought. Did you all notice that? He's, the psalmist here is kind of like me. Gets halfway through a thought, oh, i got to stop and say something. But even in the middle of some of the thoughts, oh, his mercy endures forever. Even in a time when God was not, quote unquote, associated with being merciful the writer of the psalm could look back and see God's hand of mercy in everything that he was talking about. And that's kind of true with us too, isn't it? I mean, it's difficult for us to see God's mercy while we're in the midst of something. When we're in the middle of something, I mean, we, we may know it, we may recognize it to some degree, but I think for me at least, in, I see God's mercy more in retrospect. Like when I look back as to what God has done or what he's brought me through or him giving me things that I don't deserve and praise God even more for him not giving me what I do deserve. That's when I really look back and go, his mercy endures forever. God, thank you for your mercy in that season. God, when I was being a moron, Thank you for your mercy. 
when I was being obstinate, when I was being stubborn, when I was being hard-headed, when I didn't want to listen to you, when I didn't want to see what you were wanting to show me, when I didn't listen to what you were wanting to say to me, when I did not have your perspective on what was happening, God, thank you that you had mercy on me. Because if I'm speaking for myself, there's far more times that I look back and go, I messed that up as to when I could go back and go, nailed it. Here's here's one of the challenging things for us, though. The mercy that God has shown us, He wants us to show to others. Yet, even while we were still sinners, Christ loved us, and He died for us. Even when we were opposed to God, He still had mercy on us. Are you glad for that this morning? Are you glad that even when you were opposed to God, even still, when we have our moments of acting like Israelites in the wilderness, and that stubborn hard-headedness, praise God that He has mercy on us. But then... When we turn around and we begin to see what's expected of us, that's when it gets even more challenging. Because I think that we've established through kind of taking a look at forgiveness that we readily receive and want and desire the forgiveness that God has for us. And we readily want and receive and desire to be forgiven by others. But when it comes to forgiving... That becomes a little bit more challenging. Am I right? It's it's challenging. You know, we talked about whenever we are the ones that stand in need of forgiveness, we want the Jesus of the New Testament saying that turn the other cheek. You know, when you're wrong, don't, don't respond with a wrong. When you're hurt, don't respond with a hurt. When you're damaged, don't damage in return. Whenever we stand in need of forgiveness, that's the the theology and the practice that we like to embrace is that turn the other cheek. But when somebody wrongs us, the natural tendency for us is that Old Testament eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth thing, right? Like It's really hard. It's in those moments, especially when the hurt is deep. When the damage is surmountable, whenever we begin to look at this thing and go, I I know I can get through it, but God, it's going to make me uncomfortable to do this. It's in those moments where the scripture of vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's when it gets really challenging for us, at least for me. And I think that's also true with mercy. Whenever we are the ones that stand in need of mercy then we readily receive that. We want to not receive what we actually should be receiving. But when it comes to us extending mercy to others, that's, that's a little bit of a different situation. You know, the, you know the, those people? You, you know those people. You know, the one who you just thought of their name and you're already a little agitated. You know, those people. You know the ones that you can hear their voice. And I, and I know, okay, so I'm, I'm going to make a confession here. I know that nobody else in here has ever done this, so I'll just say your pastor has. You hear, if you're in a grocery store or a department store somewhere, and you hear a voice on the other side of the aisle you're currently in. Even if there's something that you need in that aisle, I have been known to let's just go over here and look at products that I have no need for. You know, those people that just tend to push your buttons. Maybe, maybe, maybe they push some political buttons. Maybe. Maybe they push some moral buttons. Maybe 
They don't believe like you believe. Maybe their, their standard of what it is to live and to live well is different than yours. Maybe their whole complete belief system is completely different from yours. It's tough for us at that point to go, God, have mercy on them. And then for us to be merciful in kind. It's challenging. It's challenging for us. But what if, what if our voice was the voice on the other side of the grocery store aisle and God decided he needed to go the other way? Thank God he never does that. But what if? You see, mercy is one of the things that I think that is missing so much, just culturally. Okay, let's just throw a broad brush statement out there of there being a need for, for mercy culturally. But I also, and it grieves my heart to say this, but I believe is that, that as I look out, as we look out over the landscape of the church as a whole, as a capital C church, I think that's one of the biggest missing elements in our churches as well. Is a experiential, manifesting experience of God's mercy in our midst. Now I'm not saying it's completely absent. I'm just thinking that there are a whole lot of other things that we are better at than being truly merciful. And it's really important to God. And, I, and I'm going to kind of show you an, an example of this. I want to give you a visual. Um, I'm, I'm going to need nine volunteers. So give me like nine of y'all. All right. Okay, how many? Two, four, six, eight. Need one more. All right, let's just let's balance this out here. Let's balance this out. Okay, so y'all get get nice and close. We like each other. Remember. Okay. 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 It's good to see James back, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody may have a birthday today. James has, since his internship has ended, by the way, he has been preaching faithfully at uh, Princess Church uh, over on at, at 60 and Route 5 there. So thank you, James, for serving well. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Now I want to show you the importance. Most of you are going to be familiar with the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the, you know, the, the blessing statements of Jesus. And that's going to be starting with verse 3. And we're going to go down the line here. Okay, so there are nine beatitudes. There's nine blessings that Jesus speaks of here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, her the earth. The hearth. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Okay, so there's nine the attitudes. So now I'm going to ask from Jonathan down that way, take one big step that way. Simon says, because Kim's of my generation, we didn't move without Simon saying. Okay, from Kylie down. Take a, a good big step or three, four, it's fine, whatever. Poor in spirit, those who mourn. The meek, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted and reviled. What's this one right here? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I didn't say I was casting accurately, okay? I just... 
<laughs> Lord, forgive me. I apologize for that. <laughs> so right smack dab in the middle of the Beatitudes of these blessings, we find the Lord say, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Okay, now, you too, Jonathan, kindly. You step back in here, the rest of you. You can go back to your seats. Thank you. Now let's go to Micah. Go ahead and change the screen for me to the next. 6, 8. Now I'm just going to do this one. So here we've got three. This is going to be one that's a little bit familiar to you also. Act justly. And this one's going to be walk humbly with your God. Anybody remember what the center one is here? Love mercy. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Again, right in the center of this passage, we see God's mercy. Thank you guys. You can be seated. I just wanted to give you that little bit of an illustration to go with that. God's mercy in our lives is what has us where we are currently. And it's what's going to keep us. Because friends, if God were to ever remove His mercy from our lives, then we would cease to exist. The very breath that we are breathing right now is an act of mercy from the Lord. So what challenge should this present to us? I think that when we start reading, especially the Pauline letters in the New Testament, we begin to see him using this phrasing that we are ambassadors. We are representatives. We are the ones who are showing God to the world around us. When non-believers see us, hear us, read something of us, have an encounter with us, then there should be something that stands out to them. There should be a compassion in the way that we treat others. There should be a genuine, loyal love in the way that we treat others. There needs to be a sense of mercy in the way that we interact with those that we're surrounded with. And that covers everyone. Everyone that you come in contact with needs to experience God's mercy also. Amen? It's so challenging whenever we're looking at the everyone section of this, isn't it? Because if I could sit back and I could write and I could pick and choose who I wanted to be merciful to, that would be much easier. What about the person that's wronged me? Yes. What about the person that's hurt me? Yes. What about the person who gossips about me? Yes. What about the person who doesn't agree with me? Yes. What about the family member who we can't be in the same room with without arguing? Yes. What about that coworker that I dread seeing each and every time I go to work? Yes. What about that boss that I struggle with? Yes. What about that person out in public that I run into without expecting to? Die? Yes. What about that person that's damaged someone I love? Yes. What about that person who has hurt someone I love? Yes. What about someone who's hurt my kids? Yes. What about that person that has done something or is something or has represented something that is so polar opposite of what I believe, what I think, what I feel? Yes. 
for his mercy endures forever. Easy? Absolutely not. Gray areas? Absolutely not. But you see, what about this? No. They, it's still a yes. Well, what about this? No. It's still a yes. Well, you don't know that. Maybe I don't. But it's still a yes. Just as we've covered with forgiveness, the same is true for mercy. When we look at extending mercy to others, it's not going to come natural to you. So you can at least exhale on that part of knowing that you're not alone. If you struggle with showing mercy, understand you're in good company here. Because we all struggle, at least at times, with that. It is a choice. Just like forgiveness is a choice that you have to make each and every day. Being merciful is a choice that you have to make each and every day. So going back to Psalm 136, we saw that in 26 different situations, or 26 different references, it was followed by, for His mercy endures forever. What if that was the statement that people thought about in their interactions with us? That we have shown them enduring mercy. I'm nowhere close to that. I fall woefully short. Woefully short of being as merciful as God wants me to be. But that still does not take away the fact that that's what He calls us to do. It's what He calls us to be. Yeah, I want to take it a step further. As we move on in the book of Micah, into the next chapter, it makes this statement. For the Lord delights in showing mercy. Not only does He extend mercy, not only is He willing to, not only does he look at us and go, okay, they've asked for mercy. I'm going, to, I'm going to, one more time. Oh, they've messed up. I'm going to be merciful one more time. Again, we're talking about a God in the Old Testament that people thought and still think that he's a God of anger, of wrath, of vengeance. And we look and we see that God delights in showing mercy. Church, that's what we're called to do also. We're not only called to extend mercy to others, but if we're truly, our goal, our aim, our focus is to be as much like God as we can be, then we need to delight in showing mercy too. Not only extending mercy, but delighting in mercy. I want to ask the praise team if they would come back up this morning. Church, just as with forgiveness, I've said it earlier, mercy is not going to come natural to you. Every time that you show mercy you have stepped into the supernatural. Because it's not natural for us to want and desire to extend mercy. Delight in extending and showing mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Act justly. Love mercy. Pray with me this morning.
God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word and the challenge that it presents to our hearts. God, I just pray that you would help us to all be more merciful, uh, show more compassion, show more love. And God, we are so thankful that you have shown mercy to us and that you continue to show mercy to us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.